Good evening, welcome to Vaughn Moths Presents, Moths Ado About Nothing. Moths Ado About Nothing. Moths Ado About Nothing. Where we apply the revolutionary Moths scale to the classic and contemporary literature. Moths Ado About Nothing. Moths Ado About Nothing. This podcast contains mature content, spoilers, language, you have been warned. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Mots to do about nothing. My name is Chris Morgan. I'm here with Veronica Hernandez. Hello. Stephen Ramosi. Hello. And Scott Thurlow. And I have invented my own imaginary place to live in. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Today, uh, with the short story we're going to be discussing is Samaria from the Journal of, Ima- of Imaginary Anthropology uh, by Theodore Gus, published July 2014. Does anybody want to give a brief Funny logline synopsis. So I sort of tried it with what I just said. Basically, a bunch of college students or like graduate students who are uh, studying anthropology with their professor decide to invent, like on a whim almost, decide to make up an entire history of a culture and like kind of a third-ish world country, sort of developing country, I guess we'll say, that doesn't exist. But then they find themselves oddly in that very place, studying the culture and so forth and people that they've literally invented in their own minds that are now real. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. And, um, okay. Well, the story starts with our protagonist, um, Pat Nolan. Uh, he's, as Scott said, um, with, uh, three of his other colleagues. And, um, I really got caught up in it and I totally forgot that, you know, what was real and what was imagined. Mm. All right. Um, so, um, He's talking about walking this land with his guide. It's, uh, Samaria is probably, you know, I'd guess Syria ish kind of. That's what it sort of felt like, like based yeah, on the but description. Yeah, but they kind right. of mix things up because, um, uh, they have the, uh, leader of, the leader of Samaria is the Khan and he's got, uh, three children, um, Talia, uh, Anor and, uh, Shaila. And actually, did I pronounce it right? Sure. Shayla and a fourth child that they don't acknowledge, uh, because if you're a twin, one of you is the person and the other one is, is the shadow. So you have Sh- uh, Shalias. Yes. Sh- God. It's part of their like beliefs, but again, based on the things that the students themselves apparently made up, like that's part of the, the actual, or what became the actual culture is that that's how they view twins. Sure. Yeah. Um, so it, it kind of moves pretty quickly. There, there's a, the four anthropologist and he's talking about how he's, uh, has a, a residence by the, uh, the, um, servants, uh, the, the servants area of the, um, castle or not castle. The palace, I the guess. The palace, yeah. yeah. And, um, he just gets in, he gets in good with the, um, the con and, um, his colleagues, I believe, go their separate ways. They, they kind well, of. Well, they're all kind of, uh, studying different yeah, s- sections of, yeah, like, one, of, but one goes know. back to Wisconsin to get married, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically he's left alone and he's, um, in the palace with these three kids. And then they don't really, the time jumps in this are really interesting. It's kind of hard to, uh. It's a bit unclear, I guess I'll say. Yeah, because he ha- he's talking about like one minute he, the cons, uh, showing him his, uh, four kids and well, three kids he counts. Um, saying that, um, his wife and their youngest died. Um, one died of an infection and the yeah. mother died shortly thereafter. And, um, that's when he asks about the three kids and what the little girl is in the corner. And they're like, what little girl? So mm-hmm. for a minute there, I was kind of like, you know, is he seeing something? Is there, but it turns out, like I said, with the twins, um, they don't count. You know, one of them is a person. The other one's a shadow. And then flash forward, all of a sudden they're married. They're- well, I think, well, I, real quick, I think one detail was that he, the Khan, uh, asked, uh, Dr. Nolan or whatever his name was, Dr. Pat, to teach his children English. Oh, wait, that's right. So that's how he starts beginning, like, building a relationship with them. And then I guess ends up, yes, marrying Shyla or yeah. however you Shyla, say yeah. Sure, go on. That's right. So he's teaching him English. They, uh, go stay with his mom first. And then they move into a house and he starts teaching. And the shadow, I'm gonna, for simplicity's sake, <laughs> sure. I'm going to call him Shiloh and, uh, Shyla and the shadow. Um, so she go, Shiloh wants to go and become a doctor. She's going to her classes. 
Um, they moved back to America. They moved back to, yeah. yeah. They moved, sorry. This is all taking place in America. Pat goes and, uh, does his teaching and so forth. And then one night he comes home and Shiloh's cooked dinner, but it's not her. Oh, wait. Sorry. Before that, um, the shadow spending all day long, all day, every day watching CNN. Yes. Or just TV, <laughs> yeah. but a lot of CNN. But a lot, a lot of CNN, mentioned. a lot of TV. And he comes home and she's cooking dinner and, He's like, you know, where's Shyla? And she goes, I'm here. You know, basically what happened is, uh, he's got one, there's one of them now. And she's just like, guess what? Um, now I'm it? her, essentially. Yeah, I'm her, but, but her brother or somebody got shot. So and she's, also, yeah. So she's the next heir of, um, of a fictional, of Samaria. Country. Yeah. Sure. So he ends up going back. Uh, they actually have a son and he's basically teaching up there and, Basically, it sounds like the same condition, except he's no longer on the servant side. <laughs> right. Sure. I think that was it. And um, it, it was it was really interesting how they were talking about the the whole twin thing early early on in this story, and then it became such a huge part of it. Sure. Which I thought was really cool, and and the way that the story went, where it was it, it, like you know all these little clues, and then the shadow it turns out has always been just like preparing to take over. And you know, it's almost like a was, Twilight Zone was never going thing. to allow her sister no. to become a doctor. It was and and there's one like throwaway line in the story where the doctor says like, uh, "What does he say?" He's like, yeah, the, somebody found a a body on the side of the road that was unidentified. Oh, that was near the campus. I, well, I, I always wondered if it was her, but I didn't have time to like. He couldn't go back. He couldn't leave <laughs> Samaria to go back and and identify the body. Sure. Um, right. I remember that. Yep. And the creepy thing was when he when he's talking about he and uh um Sut sorry. Shyla. Shyla um lived together that the shadow would sit in the corner even watching him make love and so forth. Yeah. It's just like there's this whole really creepy right. it was the it was the weird uh, social yeah. uh Yeah. Uh, that, a- yeah, that was a, a jump from <laughs> them talking about American slang or having some sort of very dull conversation to them going to America, having sex in the room, and the shadow in the corner kind of just sitting there. Did take a quick, dark turn there. <laughs> kind of, but, yeah, so... And then it just sort of ends, really, like... Yeah, it basically... The, that's basically Kind of trails off, like, I guess I'll say, but, yeah, I'm going. Yeah, he's just talking about um, his son being bored and that he's still in Samaria. And then, at the end of the story, there is a fake biography on it, reprinted in the Journal of Imaginary Anthropology, <laughs> Dr. Patrick Nolan. Dr. <gasps> Nolan is currently a professor at Curzand University. He's cur- he is working on a history of modern Samaria. Yes. So he's got trapped in his own fictionalized yeah, world that he invented and right. teaches there now about it, <laughs> oddly. So, I mean, I, I liked it well enough overall. I did like the initial setup. Like, so... I don't want to jump the gun. I'll probably speak more about what I'm going to say in themes in a second. But nevertheless, I enjoy this kind of setup, and I've I've seen things like it before. But this one was, I think, um, executed well enough. I might give it a, a two out of three. Intro and conclusion, I'll give a one, two. The body was, yes, it was fine, but it's sort of, because of the weird time jump thing we mentioned, and just like mm-hmm. just generally like it not that it was lacking but i think it was the weakest part of the story compared to the and of course i'm always going to love the ending where you get trapped in your own like oh, yeah, imaginary thing but other than that i think it was solid overall but just at least the body not enough for me to give a one but i think i did enjoy intro conclusion pretty well i have to agree i i think i have the same um mm-hmm. issues with the story overall but i really did like the way that certain characters were presented um certain explanations yeah. and you really are encountering um you know the two different cultures one kind of standing there not judgmental but not understanding how they could think this at the same time mm. you know samaria and their um community looking at the americans as they're trying to understand their history with some sort of, um, I don't know. Um, they were they weren't really trusting, but at the same time, they felt that any ideas or anything that they were being questioned on, they just, you know, they they were very strong sure. on their beliefs. It's so, I mean, as far as that, I would even probably, though just quickly, Bruno, all our beliefs were invented by the Americans. <laughs> well, then again, do you? And I'm sure you're going to go into this, but I mean, do you know it, it was invented? Sure. I mean, is there really a clear? idea that this was in fact what happened sure. or is this again was he stuck in it to begin with 
but I would give it a two too. All right. I think that uh, I I really love the idea of this mm. story and the, this this idea of you know this invented world and like making up a world and then like finding yourself in it and having to deal with the politics of that invented world and all that type of stuff because I think a lot of the best stories kind of do that but they don't make it nearly as meta as as this one was <laughs> sure um but <clears throat> Overall, it was it was strong. It, it kept me it kept me reading the whole time. I think I'll probably give it a three for the intro buying right. inclusion. I'm not just saying this because it was my choice, but I'm going to give it a three too as well. Um, because to be honest with you, I forgot really quickly. Um, you know, it was imaginary. I started. It, sure, you're saying it, it, was, be, it was immersive or well. It was immersive. So sure. to me, really, it was. It, to, I could divide the story into two parts. Intro body one, body body two, right. outro because to me you. it just it, it was kind of like this curve, this hill that you went over, sure. and it was really fluid. So yeah, I got to give it a three. All right. All right. Okay, and Scott themes. All right. So as I, as I briefly mentioned, that this story reminded me of something, and I believe there was a line outright in the story where one of their little group um, of the graduate students is a <clears throat> like a. Um, Buys into Borgian theory, and that's a reference to uh, Jorge Luis Borges. If anyone has heard of him, he sort of is very famous for. I, I think some of his stories that are pretty much this one, but are much better written. But I like the fact that they reference it. Like it's basically using his idea, like we said, of almost offhandedly bullshitting a fake country and with fake customs and so forth, <laughs> and then it somehow is real, and you find yourself within it, like encountering real people who ostensibly you have invented and are now interacting with. So I very much like that kind of thing. Like it's sort of something that gets to me. It's like vaguely uh, magical realism, but kind of not quite. It's just like sort of a philosophical thought experiment of you know like uh, creating your own reality and then literally living in it. So I, I definitely very much like that. And I guess the secondary theme would be maybe you guys can expand upon it. Whatever they were trying to say with the the, the twins thing. Like I'm not quite sure what, if anything, was the message behind that. I mean, it was interesting little detail to include, like, like I said, ostensibly they invented that custom for this country, and now experiencing it, like <laughs> how it plays out. But I don't know what, like, the point of it was necessarily, if any, as, you know, as subcontext, if you will. Uh, I don't know the point of it either, but you know, once she's removed from her country, all of a sudden she found a she found a use for her usefulness. Sure, I guess. I, but what I'm saying is, if you're trying to attach a theme to that, I have no clue. That's why I'm asking you guys. I mean, I'm opening it up. Yeah. I was just offering some little explanation. Sure. Um, I think that there, well, there, there's this, there's this obvious theme of like the, this Middle Eastern country, it's torn between you, the United States and Russia, mm. which is, you know, more, <laughs> I suppose, that's appreciate true. than ever. I forgot about that, yeah. Um, and that's, that's kind of a, a, point, a surface theme, like kind of right there in your face. But uh, the, the thing about the twins, and I think they mentioned there, there's a line about this, there, there's a line like this somewhere in the story where it says something like, uh, like all all customs are invented by somebody at some point. Yeah, sure. Like why not by us? Like you know, yes. the idea of creating this culture is the same idea that people have when they actually create a culture. You know, like and, mm. and perhaps it's not. Perhaps you're not inventing. You know, hundreds of years of of history, but I think it's I think it's kind of a really neat idea to take something and and create this idea of like this ancient culture and then fast forward it. <laughs> You know, sure, yeah. and see what has happened in in this culture that you created. Um, I think it's a really interesting idea to do, as you know, in terms of a story and as a storyteller, it's a cool experiment. Mm. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think all that's pretty strong, and like there, there's um, the the conception of the twins being one person is. It's not necessarily kind new of, either, sure, right? It's kind of saying, an, but... an interesting take on on that, like you know, what what how how far would people go? How far do people go to believe uh, something that they've been basically brought up to believe? You know, hmm. can you completely make another person not exist in your mind? <laughs> yeah, because you have been brought up in that, you know. That's believing that part of your culture, sure. Um, and I think there, 
as strange as it probably sounds, there probably is evidence that that something like that could happen. You know? No, I definitely agree with that. I'm just saying, I, I, I'll probably give it a one at the end of the day, just for the thing I said uh, initially. And whatever they were trying to say, again, if anything, with the twins thing, yeah. like that's probably like the best angle that um, I've heard yet, so uh, Steve-O so far about it. But I didn't really think about it at the time, and I don't know. What do you think, Verno? Um, yeah, I have to agree with Scott. I really did like the idea of what's real, what's not real. You know, what who's who's really able to perceive what's going on, who isn't, who's reliable, who's not reliable. You know, I, I'm sure we're going to touch on that later on. But mm. um, as far as the twins, I have no idea. <laughs> right. um, what I are they think trying was, to say? There was a lot of superstitious things like the cats and the dogs. Um, oh, that's right. The, the cat, cat would yep. be um, mm. in Samaria was thought of as something that was respected but also feared no cats were treated i think it was um, i think they said it in their custom in their fake customs that the cats represent like guiding you to the afterlife or carries your soul or something so right you can't kill them and they're all they're like all fed yeah go on Right. And, you know, I guess they, there was no harm could come to them or else. You can't even sell them, right? Right. You yeah. couldn't sell them, but every house had a dog. So, um, it was very specific to the cats. Um, the idea in the culture about the cats was really interesting. Mm. The idea of the twins and also who played into it, who could see them, who couldn't, would they not see it or did they really not see them? Because when right. they, came to the U.S., they talked about how the mother, once they picked them up from the airport, she didn't really talk to them. Was she actually there or wasn't she? Uh, or was she just not talking to them because she was following along and she thought this was just a sure. culture thing that she had to respect? So I really, really enjoyed that. As far as themes, I'm going to give it a three because I think Wait, that... Or a one. Oh, on, you mean? <laughs> well, oh. We only have one point on this one. Oh, my bad. Okay. So I'll give it a one. I think that at least on the on those points, mm-hmm. it did very, very well. Um, it definitely kept my attention. So there you go. Yeah, I agree with most of that. One's all around. There. Yeah, I'm going to give it one. Um, uh, I, I'm ashamed, as I said, I forgot halfway <laughs> through it that um, it wasn't. It was imaginary. But I was just going to say that one of the through lines is that it kind of reminds me of like this weird like political intrigue where like it's kind of like you <laughs> know the male dominated culture. You know, the woman turns it over and, you know, basically plots to take over via her family, the woman who everybody ignores. And one little detail I want to bring up, and maybe this will go to style, but is I, I like the idea of like them dyeing their hair blue for mm-hmm. good fortune. I thought that was just like yeah. a neat little random Yeah, like, like texture. What I, got, what I got out of it is that that's something like, again, they offhandedly bullshitly threw it in as put like, oh, I bet you these, why not have a custom where everyone dyes their hair blue for fashion? And then it, they're, yeah. they're, they're fic- again. They're realized fictional con- constructs are doing. Well, so. I think I think he even said in there it was like it wasn't like a, they were dying their hair blue. They put in somewhere like blue is a color of luck and yeah, good fortune. And then, or and then yeah. like fast forward, you know, a thousand years or whatever, and people dye their hair, hair blue for good luck. You know, yeah, true. I, yeah, it was I, something like that. You're right, Steve. I think that I, like that's what I mean when I say I think it's really cool that you like start off with this base and then you just see where it has come. You know, sure. <laughs> Um, it unfolds, it evolves naturally, is it? As it maybe, yeah. Okay, and we are on to antagonist with Stevo. All right, this one's kind of a weird one. Yeah, true. Uh, like to some, it, to some extent, you could talk about like Russia as the antagonist. <laughs> yeah, I think that's more surface because say, they've but... been, you know, they've been at war with Russia. To, to some extent, you could. Talk about the chat, like Sh- Shayla's or Shayla's shadow, as the antagonist, because she murders his wife. Ostensibly, yes. <laughs> Theoretically, yep. Um, but really, who caused all the problems here? That's going to be my point, of course. Go on. Like I would say, the them themselves. You know, yes, Pat and Professor and Farrow company. and <laughs> Lisa. Like right, they invented all of their own problems. Yes. Yeah, but they all left. But Pat was the well, ostensibly. I mean, it's, it's sort of implied. But oh, yeah. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna agree with Steve-O on this front. That yes, I mean, and this is something I'll probably, I have said and will say often when it comes up is that you create your own monsters. Sometimes, literally, like <laughs> sometimes in this form. Yeah. So yeah. So basically, well as a funny logline-ish thing. A bunch of grad students who randomly bullshitted again a, a fake country find themselves stuck in it, like pretentiously, like made up a fake country, and now you have to live and teach in it. And I kind of like that stuff. So, yeah, so do I. 
I think it's an interesting idea, and I like it, but I don't know if I'm going to give it a one for antagonist. Mm. I don't know if I think of it as an effective antagonist. I, the, not to say that I don't like it, because I think it, I think it's a really interesting idea for a story, but I think I, I'm, at the end of the day, probably going to give this one a zero. I was wavering about it, so I don't know if you guys, Chris or Verno, can uh, convince me of something. Go ahead, Verno. I know what I'm going to say, but I'm waiting for you. I'm sorry if you could repeat that once more. Uh, what do you think about the antagonist? Oh, jeez. Based on who or what, if anything, is, and how effective is it? How effective is it? I, I'm if at still, all. I can't find <laughs> a specific person that I think would really fill the definition sure. of that in the story. I mean, sure, I think everyone has their own um, play in, in kind of being the, the bad guy in the story. I mean, the the shadow being shady yeah, sure. traditionally and um of course the the men in the stories who were trying to control the women but yet give them some sort of idea of liberty i mean the characters and then um the translators kind of you know teaching them but also egging them on and making fun of them as they go along and then the uh, like Sibo mentioned the i guess international uh conflict that was going on i guess if it existed or not because throughout the story the fact that they had to carry these arms it was ever present Mm. even when they were in the u.s they were hearing about about this back and forth back and forth so i think there was a lot of small things that were playing into being the antagonist but was there one strong one that really really defined it no i don't think so i get you it's it's kind of a hard one good Mm -hmm. um (laughs) before i forgot this was imaginary of course it's in the title too I was thinking it, it, it was all day long and I realized I was just like, oh, is it man versus fate? Is fate the antagonist because of the way it was set up? And now I realize that I'm going to give it a one because it's definitely Pat's self, self loathing. That's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's sort of somewhat what it's, I like. It's yeah. kind of like him criticizing his own frailty. So kind I, of something like very, something very close to that is what I'm going to argue for. And that's why I'm going to give it a one. Uh, even though I can, I see your guys points about. Generally, but I think if I'm I'm calling it that, and I think that's going to get a one from me, it almost always will. So, yeah. excellent. And uh, Bruno, with you for protagonist, and I'm going to run into the same wall that I've been running into this entire time. So I'm sorry you. for um, being so repetitive. But if there was anyone that I would think would fit the role of protagonist, would be Doctor Pat Nolan. Sure. But really, is he? I mean, really? that's the obvious choice. But yeah, the reason why I, I want agree. to choose him, I just want to just very quickly say why. Um, I think that yes, he he goes in with all good intentions to really try and absorb everything around him when they do go in there. But at the same time, in the back of his mind, he's he's imagined this, mm. he's made this up, so he's looking at it kind of entertainingly at first it sounds like i'm kind of amused sure correct and then later on it becomes more serious because he marries one of the girls that he (laughs) made up and then he's stuck in this weird sci-fi horror love story um and his mother tells him why did he marry this woman and then at the end he's just like i'm i'm stuck um and then he's not sure if the other woman existed but he forgets at times so (laughs) He's. I, I want to say he's a protagonist because again, th- even throughout the other, the whole thing, he wants to still go back to the U.S. and identify that body. Sure. But I mean, that, that's the closest I think in the story <laughs> that I could get to a protagonist. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to score it low because I still don't think that he it's was strong enough, enough in yeah. that in that position. Well, like we said, uh, the road to fake hell, of course, is paved with good intentions. But <laughs> I mean, of course, like it's pretty much outright Doctor Pet because you follow him throughout the story. Yeah. But it's weird because, again, it's tough. I thought he was a fine, well-done protagonist, but not quite strong enough. Like, it might be a very soft zero at the end of the day for me. Yeah. But I just don't... I think, like I said, the ideas are stronger in this story than perhaps the characters and how they were portrayed themselves. So I guess that's how how, how I came down on it. I'm going to slightly disagree with you guys. I think I'm going to probably score this one because I like his introspection mm-hmm. throughout the entire... Uh, book. I mean, the, the, or book, short story. Uh, like, honestly, that's kind of the only way you can write this character, I think, yeah, because no, you I need, get it. Yeah. you need to, like, know what he was thinking in order to make this a clear story. But I thought that his, um, going through all of the, like, everything that happened and, um, just kind of discussion of it in his own in his own notes, you know, like mm. in his own story. I thought I, I liked that a lot. 
I like the idea of this as like kind of a diary for him. Yeah, no. Or journal. I get that. I hear you. And um so I did I did think maybe he was a little bit thin as a character, but I think I think that all of that interesting stuff made up for it for me. Mm. So is it a one, Steve? It's a one for me, yeah. I'm just going to say it because I'm going to do sup- supporting characters next, but um, I'm going to give these next to a one because it is all him. Um, it's it, it's kind of like I, lo- I lost where the fantasy began and reality be- you, you, know, you found yourself in Samaria as well. <laughs> yeah, I found myself in Samaria as, as, as well, yes. definitely. I mean, I get it. It's like, yeah, like, like I said, I could have gone either way, but I think – for you, Steve, and it seems like also for you, Chris, that the strong outweighs the weak, or I think it's the reverse of me, like, yeah. but just by a narrow margin. Because so. if it is all him, I mean, he's trapped in there. These are aspects of who he it. is. So I just want to make clear that this isn't biased. It's all of a sudden I'm like, <laughs> all right. I can't all of a sudden separate one from the other one. All right. I got you. Yeah. Supporting characters. What do you guys think? I actually did like them. I thought they were almost more believable than <laughs> Dr. Pat in a sense. But at the same time, of course, half of them at least are like imaginary. But that means they're imagined and in quotes and realized quite well. Mm-hmm. Like I, the shadow, shallow shadow, essentially, I thought was probably the most intriguing character, not all because of the setup of the beliefs and also like how that story played out, how that little subplot, if you will, played out. And I like the Trent, like Alpha was pretty well. The Khan had, had some good scenes, like a scene yeah. or two. So I like them all. Like, I believe them again, as you said, Chris, like, even though they were, they're like doubly fictional, <laughs> they're fictional people in a fictional story that's created by a fictional person who's creating their own fictional world. And, you know, and it's like turtles all the way down. But I, I, all I'm saying is I'd like the supporting characters that were in the story possibly better than, as I just said, the protagonist ostensibly himself. I agree. I think they, really fill out the world. I don't have too much more to say about supporting characters. I like them, and Scott, you named basically yeah, all of them. I mean, them. there's not like, many, so... Uh, I, I thought that the the world felt full to me mm. while I was reading it, yeah. and that's what I look for, supporting characters to kind of manage a lot of the times. So, yeah. I mean, and 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 Shyla's shadow was a very intriguing little thing to put in, something different that you don't normally see in a... in, a, you know, in every, every other short story. Yeah, absolutely. The fact that a lot of the supporting characters didn't have a lot of dialogue, um, mm. I, which again, we're going to touch in a second, but, um, the way that they were described, the shadow walking six, uh, steps behind at all times in the corner <laughs> of the room, yep, true. um, sitting while they're watching TV, that it gives you an idea of that, that person, if it ever existed. And, I just want to mention that Lisa was one of the uh, graduate students oh, yes. that went over there, and I she had no dialogue, I think, in the story except for so description of things that she did in creating this world in their in their mind. Uh, but at the end of the story, when they do go back to Samaria, it's because centuries ago one Khan was convinced to give his daughter the ability to become the to, heir. to inherit the throne yeah. yes and he the the main character dr pat nolan says you know he pretty much damns her like damn you lisa for <laughs> inventing of, like, this in the back kind of or it was probably but... like her but i mean sure those kind of comments or um ideas or thoughts in the story i really think gave the secondary characters a really nice you know there's a death to them yes yes i agree so i'm giving them one yeah yeah as will i yep and uh scott it's on to you with dialogue all right so this is another one i was sort of iffy about or like kind of flip-flopping so and we run up to this problem a number of times at this point um we're doing things like this is that should i take every like internal thought from dr pat as dialogue or should i put it into style it's difficult to cut up. Sometimes we sort of convince ourselves to do it one way or another. So I'll just handle, I guess, the actual spoken dialogue first. It was okay at best. But as you said, sort of, Chris, you, it's not necessarily the whole point. The whole point is his internal, like, dealings with the situation that he's created and found himself in and everyone else around it. So if I take it to be as such, then both of them together would probably get a one. But if I'm going on just the spoken dialogue, I think it's just not good enough to give it a one. So you guys can convince me like whether or not I should, in fact, enfold that into dialogue. You you basically just said exactly what I was going to say, yeah. Scott. I, I mean, I, I'm taking uh, the internal all, all this like as part of the style. It's a journal style, and it's all really interesting. And yeah, it is good. 
the actual spoken dialogue is all right. Right. It's yeah. not. It's not worth. A, it's not worth a one. I would yeah, say. Yeah, that's pretty much how I come down. And it's funny because I know I, I figured you might uh, say this if I didn't first Evo, but because like I said, I know we discussed it. So, what do you guys think over there? I can't add more to that. I think you guys pretty much said Do you agree exactly. with the way we broke it down? Yeah, I okay. think that's exactly how you're saying, you know, if it was just dialogue alone mm. and you're taking that as, you know, in the story, then, yeah, I would think that it's a little bit weak. But I think that, yeah, it's the thoughts that Professor Nolan had. I really think that was more dialogue in the story than anything. So I'd give it a one, too. Okay. Um, oh, wait, you're giving it a one? I'm giving it a one. Because oh. she's enfolding that into dialogue. Okay, so, okay. so yeah. you are taking... Okay, that. actually, I'm going to give it a one because all of a sudden I realized that the shadow, out of all the characters, because all the characters kind of seem like Cypher's even his his wife, <laughs> sure. but she seems to be the one who comes alive. It's kind of like mm. that's a part of her because I remember I was reading this and I thought, you know, everything's serviceable. And you know with me, dialogue has to kind of be like either non-existent or, or serviceable. And what I mean by, by non-existent, like banal. Yeah. Um, but her dialogue with him when he comes home and, um, she's like, what do you mean? I'm Shyla. I've always been Shyla. The only Shyla there is. I was like, this is creepy. And sure, that was a good moment. It, it, but... I know that stuff, but dialogue like that in, in endings like this always get me. I think I always like that. And the fact that we were talking about the supporting character and I started thinking about that, that she really seemed to be, you know, whatever part of him was the most self-loathing in a way that was her. So I, I'm going to give it a one for, for definitely her. And then for the reason, reasons that Bruno said, all right, I'm going to shift most of the credit to style and give dialogue a zero. Yeah. When we, and we'll come up to that in a sec. Okay. And Steve-O with style. So style, mm-hmm. we kind of just talked about this. Exactly. Uh, I thought, I thought that the journal style was really interesting and that's where a lot of the most, important yeah. quote unquote dialogue came from was all his internal thoughts and and that was where the interest in this was. And and not only that, not only it being journal style, but it being the story of an invented land was really fascinating for me. Like uh, there's sorry, sorry like a fake journal of fake anthropology. Right. Imaginary <laughs> and it becoming real like there's so much about this style that I really loved. And uh, like this is gonna probably the strong my strongest one of the I agreed. Of the entire, you know, of of this entire story, um, I, I'll leave the rest up to you guys if you want to talk about anything else. But I, you know, I loved it. No, I don't much more to add. Like you said, we just basically just covered it, and I gave you my reason why. And I think yes, it's probably, if not the strongest, one of the strongest uh, ones for me. If I cut it up the way I just said, for yeah, style. I, I kind of knew right away when I started reading this by paragraph three that style was getting a one because. The description he descriptions he gives of the bizarre and the tastes mm. and the smells, yeah, it was all you know, very and, well and the, I'm just saying that 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 really hooked me into making this me believe this was a living, breathing world. And then when things would fade in the background, and then sh- when shadow would, it, it, there was a lot of contrast in the story. So sure, yeah, and I can't add any more. I think we've really covered. Can you give it a one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay, and Veronica, would you recommend? Uh, Samaria from the Journal of Imaginary Anthropology. So at first, uh, my immediate reaction was, what? (laughs) (laughs) All right. But now kind of going over the story and actually having this conversation with the three of you, I would have to say that I would recommend it. Would it be a strong recommendation? It would be a soft one. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, you know, we've, we've gone over all the... The areas, I don't think it would be that strong of a story that I'd say, hey, this is definitely something that you need to sure. read. Again, because Scott, you know, mentioned it earlier. This is something that I've seen this style with other authors, and I think they've done a much better job at it. But I wouldn't say don't read it. It would just be a soft one. I pretty much would say <laughs> exactly what you just said. I, I, if I can just rephrase it, yeah. As I said, I like this idea, so I like it when it's executed, and I think the story executed pretty well. It's just that, as I ref- as it itself referenced Borges, and as I did, I would probably recommend one of his stories first. But if someone's like, "Hey, I came across this story, uh, should I read?" I'm like, "Yeah, you know what? It was pretty solid." So it was not a strong recommendation, but I I don't think I can give it a zero. I think it was an enjoyable read, and I'd probably read it again, you know, later down the line at some point. I just that I, as. As we both said, uh, Veronica and I, that there are just other things that do this better, but this one was perfectly fine too. 
Yeah, I I mean, I I'll give it a stronger recommendation. I would say I I really like the the you know I've been saying this the entire time, but I really like the idea of this story, and it kind of swept me off my feet for twenty five minutes while I was reading it. You know, I didn't notice time going by. Sometimes when you're reading a bad story, it's just like God, when is this thing gonna be over? <laughs> like this one was kind of it, it was I started it and then I was done. You know, mm-hmm. pretty quickly. It seemed it seemed sure. very fast. So I would definitely give it a recommend. And it's gonna be, it's a short story and it won't take you very long to read. So uh check it out. I agree with Steve though, uh for all of his reasons except that it it wouldn't be like a hey everybody's got to read this but the people I know who want to read this I would definitely exactly what Steve-O said and I'm an asshole that I picked up I did, I, I, I got so immersed so I'm definitely going to read this again myself All right. well technically it was your pick anyway but you're still I like know I know it was and I'm an asshole and I um, that's cool this week got busy and I have to admit I read the three stories today while I was waiting for my car to get done <laughs> so All right. I, nothing so, wrong with that no but the, the thing is the done. three stories captured my attention so you know there you go um, okay, so um, the scores. I've got the scores here. Uh, we got Chris giving it the highest score with a 10, myself second with an 8, and Scott and Veronica both gave it a 7, giving us an aggregate, a- aggregate score of an 8. Yeah, I think nice. That's, that's pretty solid. I think that's it's about definitely, right. I think we kind of covered the strengths and weaknesses. Even score. Alrighty. Um, well, that's been it. Uh, my name is Chris Morgan, and I have been here with Veronica Hernandez. Have a good one. Stephen Armosi. Good night. And Scott Thurlow. And now we return, of course, to our own imaginary worlds. Good night. <laughs> See you next good time. Good night. <laughs> Editing and engineering by Christopher Morgan. Music by Christopher Morgan. Check us out on YouTube and iTunes for the shows, and on Facebook and Twitter for updates. <laughs>